Thank you, Ernie. You may take a seat. Kids are dismissed for Sunday school out in the back. Hey, welcome. I know Megan already gave the announcements, but if you're new here, specifically welcome to you. Thank you for visiting our church. There's a card in front of you. Uh, we'd love for you to fill out just a way for us to get to know you. Um, a couple announcements before we look at the Word of God together this morning uh, is I want to make it available after service, um, after everything. There'll be some people in the front here. If you need prayer for anything, for your family, for you, for someone else, I uh, just want to encourage you to, to come on up. Um, it's not going to be in front of everybody. Most people will be outside, but just that that's available to you. Uh, second thing I just want to talk about is uh, as our church has been growing this last couple of years, we're, we're entering, uh, we're finishing up our third year, which is crazy to think about uh, come January. There's a couple of needs we have, and I just want to kind of throw this out there. If you are gifted with numbers or finances, um, I don't know if she is Michelle Jansen in here. Is she well, she, she's in the back. She has handled at our budget the entire time and it's been such a blessing. Can, can we give her a round of applause, by the way, just to thank her? Um, but we want, we want to kind of form a team starting next year, maybe two or three people that are gifted with finances. And, and so if you're interested in that, God's put it on our heart, come talk to us afterwards and we'll tell you how, to, how to, that works. Uh, the, the other thing with that is we meet in this beautiful facility and all of that, um, but we want to we start working on some projects. And so if you are handy or, or gifted in, in beauty or plants or whatever, we want to form a team for that as well. So if that's you, if you know how to work on stuff, you're good at gardening, and not that you're going to be mowing the lawn. Um, but but, but just more of like, hey, a flower pot right here and this plant will work in half shade, half sun. You know who you are if you know that kind of stuff. Um, so stuff to think about, come see me, Alan, or Steve, or Skyler afterwards. Uh, but let's pray and look at the Word of God together. Again, happy you're all here this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for another day. I thank you, Lord, that because of your cross, because of your sacrifice, we can truly wake up in the morning and say, what a wonderful day. Behold, what a day the Lord has made. God, that your mercies are new every morning. That your faithfulness is great. What a joy it is because of your gospel and the truth of your word. That even though all of us come here bearing mistakes and sin and baggage and struggle, there is freedom, there is hope, there is grace, there is forgiveness of sins and the victory over sin that your gospel offers us. So I pray that you'd speak to our hearts this morning. Be with us, Lord. Would we be able to tune out everything that's gone on this week, all the stress, the anxiety, the things that are on our mind, and would we'll be able to take a brief moment and focus on you and hear you speak through your word. In your name we pray, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. That's where we'll be this morning. But you don't have to teach a kid this, they, they just learn it. Maybe some of you have seen it. Have you seen that moment, it's really cute, where a young kid starts to imitate their mom, dad, or an adult. You ever seen that? Uh, where the kid maybe is wearing dad's shoes and it's really cute, they're walking, uh, they, they play like they're talking on a telephone or something like that. Just a couple weeks ago, we, we were with Dan and Trish, a couple at our church, and they have a two-year-old boy, and he had gotten a broom and was so rigorously sweeping, and they're like, oh my gosh, he's got this servant's heart, you know, and it was really cute, but I'm wondering if that'll keep up till high school. Um, but you know, you see these kids, they're just excited to imitate those around them. And we don't just do that as kids, we do that as adults, whether you know it or not, even in how we dress, don't we? Uh, do you know this, that there was a time where cyclists wore normal clothes? <laughs> there wasn't spandex, it wasn't a thing, right? But, 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 but what happened is that you got the Tour de France and all these famous cyclists, and then it became a thing of, I'm going to imitate that, and now we have to see people in spandex everywhere. Um, I'm not judging, if you're a cyclist, it's great exercise, it's good for you, just don't wear your spandex to church. Um, but you know, that th we imitate people, we find categories to be in. When I was growing up, I I'm not one to say much, because the thing for me, when I went into middle school, was you sagged your pants. Remember that trend? Uh, you got to see guys sagging their pants everywhere we go. And, and then it shifted to skinny jeans, and, and then it shifted from that to really baggy jeans, and now it's Crocs and pajamas anywhere you go. 
I was in Target the other day. It was a grown man, like in his 40s, right? A, a, a Christmas pajama pants, Crocs with the little charms. And the guy was married with kids. But uh, it, it's just that, that, you know, but, but what happened is how we get these trends is we see a celebrity or somebody famous, and then we imitate them, right? I don't, I don't think firemen always used to have mustaches until a really cool fireman got a mustache. But I can go down the list of that we all understand what it is to imitate people. And, and maybe you're here and you're like, well, that's not me. I set my own trends, like I don't imitate people, I'm a, I, you know, I carve my own path kind of person. But you can be imitating a type of person or people without even knowing you're doing it. You know that? I, I mean, kids don't even know they're doing it. They're just, have you ever met that there was that little kid at church once who said maybe a four-letter word or something like that? And instantly you assume, oh, how do your parents talk at home? What goes on behind the scenes? You, you know, and then the parents are devastated. Um, but sometimes it just happens. Doesn't it? I mean, for some of you, the way you handle conflict is because you grew up watching older people handle conflict, and maybe it wasn't healthy, and you didn't know you're imitating it, but it just comes out, right? Like mother, like daughter, like father, like son, and you avoid conflict, or you get really angry. See, the problem is uh, not all role models are created equal. And we can, without knowing, just because something's normal and we see it all the time, it can just become normal and we can become to imitate it, even though we don't understand it. And so Paul here in Scripture, he says, this is really important. One of the concepts he introduced in chapter 4, if you remember, is he says, I want you as Christians to mature in Christ. I don't want you to just come to know Jesus and be like, I'm going to heaven now. He says, I want you to grow and mature in your sanctification and holiness. And one of the main ways that we grow as human beings and mature is by imitating those who are mature, isn't it? And so he says here, who you imitate matters. It's not just a passive thing. And you live in a world where people are passive about this and they just kind of walk around, I'll imitate you, I'll imitate you. It is what it is. And he says, no, you need to be proactive in this. And so the question this morning is who are you imitating and how is that affecting your life? Uh, so look at verse 1 of Ephesians 5. He says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So he gives us a command that we are to imitate who? God, right? Uh, and imitation in the Greek, there is, it means to mimic, to try to be like, to copy. It's the same as we understand it today. But then you get, you get asked the question, okay, well, what does it mean to imitate God? Because there's been different cult leaders in the past, right, who have said, hey, I, I am God, right? I, I'm the most like God you can be. Like you had Charles Manson. Uh, we had this guy, where's his name on here? His name was uh, Sun Moon, who created the Unification Church, right, and told everyone he was God. So what does it mean to imitate God? Well, look at Paul explains this. Walk in love. Okay, so the first way that I imitate God is i got to walk in love. But then what does that look like? Because the way that we define love changes a lot. Is this kind of the love of the 1960s and the hippies with the VW buses, right? Uh, just free love, just have a good time. Is that what he's talking about? I'm not so sure, right? Or is it the love today that in order to be truly loving, you, you can't ever tell someone they're wrong and you just have to just be like, hey, whatever you want to do, search it within yourself and you're good. Is that the kind of love he's talking about? Well, look, at he explains even that. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So as you want to imitate God, number one way you do it is you walk in love. Well, how, what kind of love? The love that Christ had for us. What kind of love is that? Let me read this text. John 15, Jesus said this. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So there it is. He says, greater love, has no, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. He says, the love I'm talking about is sacrificial love. And in fact, if you look at all throughout the New Testament, and even the Old Testament, when the Bible and God talks about true love, um, he's talking about this concept of selfless love, of sacrificial love like Christ. And this is so countercultural because today, love for us is a contract, isn't it? I will love you if you love me back. Or I'll love you as long as you're attractive and have the body type that I like. Or I'll love you as long as you're successful and can give me the things that I want to give. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. And that's how we understand love. But the biblical concept is no. Love is a decision in which you choose to sacrifice yourself for that person. That's what Christ says. Look at another verse. 1 Corinthians 13. You'll recognize this verse. He says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Beautiful passage. Notice the language. He's saying the love, really true love. And please don't be thinking about Princess Bride, as I'm going to mention that a lot. Um, but true love 
is the idea of it's not selfish. It's giving to someone else. It's choosing to put someone else above yourself. Luke chapter 6. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. He's saying even when people don't deserve it, even when they're enemy, you choose to sacrifice yourself like Christ did it for you. That's a high standard, isn't it? Because literally he's saying, hey, you need to imitate God. You need to have this kind of love with all the people around you, even your enemies. I mean, this is the image that, that I thought of this week. Uh, I, you know Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Night before he's going to go be crucified. And, and, and he's, he's, he's literally goes and he, and he kneels down. He begins to pray. And it says he starts to sweat droplets of blood because the stress was so high. You know this picture. And so he's praying. And he told his disciples who were with him, he says, hey, just one thing, right? What would he tell them? Go pray. And don't fall asleep. Go pray. And and you think if they're like, man, this is a dire situation, we're going to pray. But imagine being Jesus. You're like, God, please, if there's any other way, would you take this cup from me? And then over here you hear, what would your response be? You you think Jesus would be like, are you serious? But but, but instead he he goes, hey, guys, could you remember, please, to pray and not sleep, okay? Um, But they do it again. And And even at that point, he gets taken He's beaten. His body is mutilated. He's on the cross. And most of his disciples, which have denied him or run away in fear like cowards, and maybe there's some that are in the crowd hiding, kind of looking at him, and you think Jesus would be up there on the cross like, I'm done. Beam me up, Scotty. It's over. I'm not doing this for these people. But what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the standard of love. That's the standard of love that that, that Paul says, hey, church, you want to imitate God? You imitate that in your home, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your church, wherever you're at, you do that. Because true love doesn't say, what can I get? It says, what can I give? It doesn't feel natural. Because I think what, what happens in today's world is we get used to the world around us, don't we? And we get used to just following it, imitating it. This is what love is. This is how people in loving relationships act. This is the norm. But Paul says, hey, I don't want you to look to that to imitate. I want you to look to a higher calling, which is God and what he did. And so he's established that's Christ, that's love. And now we're going to read several verses. And Paul's going to say, hey, this is what it doesn't look like to imitate God. And this is how that idea of selfishness and non-sacrificial love has, has crept into areas that I created and called good and have now been corrupted. And so let's look at some of these in verse 3. He says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. First ones, he says, sexual immorality and all impurity. You know, some of you are like, man, this is the wrong Sunday to come if we're going to talk about this. One of the number one arguments I've heard from young people and, and some older people that I've met with when they say, this is why I can't become a Christian. And they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I can go to church. That's okay, right? You know, as long as service doesn't go super long, uh, I'll go to church. Uh, you, you know what? I can even give some of my money, right? I, I can do some of that. I'll do some of those things. I'll say I'm a Christian. Um, but don't tell me who I can sleep with and who I can't sleep with and what I need to do with that. I'm not surrendering that. I'll surrender everything else, but not this. And I think that's so common for so many people. You know, it used to be a norm in America and most of the world that, that sex and the word commitment always work together. That the concept was, if I'm going to sleep with someone, that that means I'm committing it to that person, that I'm going to love that person, I'm going to be faithful to that person, I'm going to care for that person. But just over the last 70 years, those two words couldn't be further apart in society, could they? That we've abandoned that concept altogether. That, it, that it's, we, may, we may use the phrase, make love, but it's really, I want to use you for what I want, but I don't want to commit to you because if something, someone better comes along or something doesn't work out, then I want a door out the back that I can exit. Where the concept of love in the Bible is this selfless thing of I'm going to commit to love you, hard times, good times, better for worse, commitment, I'm with you, I'm there, right? And we've totally turned that upside down. And we've abandoned what Scripture has said. Scripture says this, Genesis chapter 2, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's the definition of marriage. Hebrews 13, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. 
It's hard. I, I, I get it, especially because the norm in our society today is that my sexual desire is good no matter what it is, and I may do what I please, and that's how I become a complete person. And then people hear this book, and you're like, wait a second, you're saying between a man and a woman in marriage, that's it? That's so limiting. That, how, how could you even say that? How could I ever be fulfilled? That, that's such a hard thing. It's such a hard task to follow. But it's what the Word of God says. The Roman Catholic Church got this wrong for so many years. They said, well, sex is, yes, it's in marriage. Yes, it's for that. Um, but you can't enjoy it. They used to be like, the, the only point of sex is for procreation. And the Word of God doesn't say that. Even in Proverbs 5, it says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer and a graceful do doe. And Scripture says, no, sex is designed by God. It's good. You don't, have to, you don't have to be like the Roman Catholic Church. Say, don't talk about it. Don't think about it. Don't, don't, don't. It's like, no, it's good. It's designed by God in marriage between a man and a woman. That's what God's made. But we have all kinds of objections to that, don't we? Well, how, how am I ever going to be satisfied in life? How, uh, that's so hard to live by because i got temptations. And I'll never be a completely whole person. And how, wh what does that mean for what I look at on the internet? And, and how do I handle this? And what we've done as a society is we've gone so far from that and just said it is whatever you want. It's a free-for-all. But the problem with that is it doesn't work, does it? A couple years back, Sarah had a friend she met in college, and she got married to a guy who was kind of a classic love story. We knew them, and um, they had two kids, and she was pregnant with a third on the way. And, and the, the way their marriage worked was she didn't work, and he worked, and he made decent money. Um, and then one day, he came to her out of the blue, and he says, I'm leaving you. And she's like, well, why are you leaving me? I thought we were fine. We've been doing okay. He's like, I've realized, as I've been seeking to find myself, that I'm attracted to men and not women. And so, therefore, I'm going to leave you for this man that I've met at work. And the problem is, in today's culture, what can you tell that guy? Because if you tell him, no, you should, you should fight that, and you should love your wife and be committed to her and raise your kids, you are telling him, I'm going to restrict something that supposedly is your entire identity and makes you whole as a human being. Because your sexual identity is the core of who you are. That's what society says. And so if I tell you, you can't go explore that and you should love your family, then I am denying you a basic human right to explore your sexuality. What do you say? Because if you come and say, well, hey, the Word of God says, the Word of God says that, that you are more than your sexual desires. That your identity is not just your sexual cravings. That your identity is in Christ to surrender all things to Him and that you should love your family out of obedience to Him and be sacrificial instead of selfish just about what makes you happy. You can't tell them that. Because that's hateful, isn't it? And this applies across the board. It just so happened that for him it was another man. But even if it was another woman, right? We'd still say the same thing. I don't care if it's heterosexual, homosexual, whatever it is. God has designed this for a purpose for his glory and it's a problem in our society that we don't know how to deal with and what's happened is it's become a norm because everybody's doing it every tv show talks about it every one presents sex in this way and so we don't even notice it anymore and it was the same thing in ephesus ephesus different kind of struggles but they had the temple of artemis we've talked about this how, how do you go worship at the temple as a male will you pay to sleep with a prostitute and that money funds the temple you would be a good moral upright man to go do that if you're a roman man of stature it was very normal for you to have a, your wife that raised your kids but you have other rooms in your home for your other side women that would live with you and they were just there kind of for sex and that was perfectly socially acceptable and it's perfectly socially acceptable for the man to sleep with however many women he wants. But, but the woman, if she slept with anyone besides her husband, she was considered horrible. And she'd be an outcast. It was totally hypocritical. And so Paul wrote the church, the church in Corinth, which had the same issues. In chapter 7, he says this, The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the, life, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. You read that like, whoa, that doesn't sound good. What, what does that mean? But look what he says next. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul here, he, he says, hey, turn it upside down. There's, there's a way that God designed this. It's not meant just selfishness. It's not meant to be just for your gratification, your desire. It's meant that you would commit to another human being, both men and women, in a relationship called marriage. It's not that Christianity thinks low, has a low view of sex. It's that we have a high view of sex that's made by God. 
that it's good, that it's good to be pursued in marriage. And, and the problem is tr- culture has made it very low. It doesn't matter. Do what you want to do. It's you got drunk one night. Well, it was, a, it was a mistake. Mistakes happen. Oh, well, you know what? You were sad because your dog has mange. And you know, you know what? So you hooked up with that person. But, you know, it's okay. It's just, that's, the bumps in the road make you who you are. And we make it no big deal. Word of God says no. It's something that you lay your life down for another person. But the objection that I think some of us, maybe even in this room, say, well, that's still really limiting, and is God's way really better? Because what's the problem? If it's consensual and two people love each other, then what's the issue? Why does it need to be in marriage, and why does it need to be male or female or all this? But but let's kind of walk through some of these that God wants to protect us. Ten Commandments. Don't commit adultery. I think that's the one in our society today that we say, yeah, you know, adultery, not, not really good. But you can't stand behind that because if I'm no longer attracted to this person and my attractions are elsewhere, how do you stand behind that? So is adultery actually a problem and how do you stand to commitment? You notice he, sa- he said sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness. Covetousness is desiring something that is not yours, right, in a sinful way. And Jesus came and he brought the level even higher with this, the standards. He's not just saying, hey, just don't sleep with other people. He's saying, what you think in here actually matters. And that's so relevant today uh, because we're the generation of pornography, aren't we? The introduction of this in the last hundred years, I mean, 70% of Americans look at pornography on a monthly basis. And that's just those who admit that. It's huge. It's across the board. How are we handling this? And and I've heard people say, well, it doesn't really, it only affects uh, me. It doesn't really affect other people. And and we just throw out even the non-Christian statistics of how many people are actually in slavery in those videos and doing it against their will. And then how that affects your mind and how that affects that you view other people as objects for your sexual gratification rather than people made in the image of God to be pursued and loved sacrificially. It warps us, it destroys marriages, it destroys your future kids even. We'll go into the statistics of children later. But see, God writes the church and he says, church, I want you to be different. I want you to be free of this. This is destructive. You've got to change this. And imagine that the, the, the people in Ephesus in that church, they were living in a cesspool, right? That there were people who were just like, okay, I'll go to church, I'll see what this thing's about. There would have been guys in the church that were like, hey, I still got my side girls at my house. I was at the temple yesterday doing this, right? The women that are grieving the issues that were going on over here and here. And Paul's saying, hey, I know it's hard. I know it's a high calling, but Christ is worth it. And freedom in Him is worth it. Can you trust in that? Covetousness, and and it's not just lust, right? But it's that you desire, maybe it's for you as a lady that you desire that the other husband, not just for sex, but just the way he treats his wife and his kids and how present he is and how good he is and what it is. And coveting is where you're upset almost. You can't find joy for that woman because you look at them and you want that so bad for yourself that you can't enter into that joy. You know how this works. Paul says, I want your marriages to be different. Even with couples that are married, there's still selfishness that comes in and the abuse that comes in. I was reading an article the other day, again, a non-Christian article, but it was saying that that there's so many people, what they see on the internet and pornography, uh, they want to bring that into their marriage in that they saw this person in this video or this image do this, and so they have this expectation on their spouse to do this. Even if it harms their spouse, they don't care because it's about what they want, and it's wreaking havoc in relationships. Maybe it's not that, but maybe for you, it's, it's that you know you can kind of manipulate your spouse be, by withholding this from them. Well, I'm angry at you, or I'm bitter at you, so I'm not going to do that. And, and I'll get you to do what I want because I'm going to hold this from you as a, as a way to be on top and control. Paul says, no, this is not how God's called us. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know? Well, let, me, let me pause there. So he says, okay, uh, abstain from sexual immorality. You're like, okay, yeah, that's hard. Why should I do it? And then he gives the why this is important, why this is good. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is the beauty of the Bible. This is the beauty of the truth. Culture says your sexual cravings are what make you who you are. That's your identity. That's the greatest part of you. That's the the, the greatest core of yourself. Christianity says, no, it's not. What did he say? What's the key there? What did he say? This is what makes you who you are. What did he say? Your body is the temple 
of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so you have a purpose to glorify God. That's an amazing statement. Because how many people out there They hurt inside. They're in pain. They're in agony. Not not even in this area, but they're hurting because of a lack of parent or lack of mother or pain because of an insecurity or something. And then they go and they're like, what is it that's going to solve this hole inside my heart? And they're told by the media, by TikTok, by teachers, by even school books and textbooks, the problem, the hole in your heart is not God. It is not your morality. It's that you maybe don't know yourself fully sexually, and if you explore enough and find enough, then you'll be complete. And they go down this spiral controlled by the devil in our society, and it makes it worse and worse, and it's tragic. Where the Word of God says, hey, sex can be a part of your life, but it's not everything. It's a small piece compared to knowing God. God says this can't be the norm. Let's look at verse 4. I promise there'll be some hope at the end of this sermon. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So now he he goes in and he says, as Christians, this this should not be the norm. Uh, Filthiness is morally obscene talk, shameful, indecent, offensive, foolish talk, poor judgment, lacks wisdom, crude joking, not appropriate, or often sexually charged in the original language. Uh, And and what he's getting at is, as a Christian, um, you need to be different. You need to take God who's holy, but what society does is they laugh about this stuff. And we see that today. Right? Every show, every sitcom, it's a light little deal. It's not a big deal. And, and the stuff doesn't really affect you that much because as long as you're enjoying it, as long as you're being true to yourself, you're okay. But see, the Word of God says, no, this has devastating effects. Because any sin, like all sin, Satan loves, and its purpose is to bring about destruction. Let me, let me read you some statistics. One in three girls are sexually abused before the age of 18 in the United States. 93% of them know their victims. So meaning this isn't somebody on the street. Somebody in their home. Father-in-law, dad, mother, brother, cousin, uncle. One in three, 33%. Um, Human trafficking is a $150 billion industry, making it the second most profitable illegal industry in the United States. What that means is this is prevalent, this is real, this is present in our society. There are more than 365,000 missing children in our country, in America, every year. One third are for sex trafficking, 109,000 children. In San Diego County alone, the, there are an average of six to 8,000 children trafficked each year. That's next door. The United States hosts more sexual, sexually abused child content online more than any other country. Around 90% of all children abused sexually are under the age of 10. 80% of children by the age of 17 will have viewed pornography. This is a problem. And it's not getting better. And we are, as a culture, laughing. In our shows, in our music, in our conversations, we don't take it seriously. And God reminds us, the church, he says, no, you don't play with this. Because anything that's charged by sin wreaks havoc, and God hates sin. Let me read you verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or is covetous, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. God hates sin. And he sees all this stuff, doesn't he? He sees all those statistics. For him, it's not just a statistic. He knows those kids by name. He knows those people by name. He knows the the, the men and women who have lost their jobs and family because of the addiction of lust and pornography, the affairs that have left kids homeless on the street. He knows the teenage girl, the precious girl made in the image of God that's seeking so hard to be loved and is taken advantage of by the other teenage guys that just want to hook up or do whatever, and her heart's broken, and so she goes to the next guy and the next guy and the next guy to the point where she's so hurt and brutalized inside that that, that she becomes callous. God sees all of that and says sin matters and I have to judge it. But let's pause for a moment. It's been heavy. right? You're probably like, why did I come this Sunday? What do we do? Because I'm going to guess that the majority of us in this room have failed in some sort of way sexually 
sinned in some sort of way in this area. Some of us still regularly struggle in this area. God's judgment's coming upon it. He hates it. So what, what does that mean? I have to cower in fear? Do I have to hide in fear? J. Vernon McGee said this, if you can get into sin and not be troubled or bothered by it, you're not a child of God. That's a terrifying statement because he's saying if you can live in sin and it never bothers you and you never worry about it, then are you really saved? And so what, what is our response? And in the church in Ephesus, did they read this and they're like, okay, I'm out because I'm just scared of God now. Do I have to just get myself pure and then I'm good? Look at the line that gives us all hope, verse 8. He talks to the church. He speaks to us. He says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are a light in the world, in the Lord. What does he mean by that? Because he's speaking to people like us, people in Ephesus back in that church and us, where we all have some issues in this area, don't we? A lot of us have really fallen. We have some serious baggage in this area. So what does that mean? Is God just like, yeah, well, you're on go to hell in a handbasket. See ya. He says, you were darkness, but now you're a light in the world. And you're like, well, yeah, God, but, but I'm still struggling, so am I still darkness? This is the beauty of the gospel. We are not saved based upon our actions. We are saved based upon what? Grace and faith. That you become a child of God. You become a light in this world. Not because you have a perfect, clear history track record, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. I remember I was meeting with some uh, middle school guys years ago, and one of the guys, uh, I'm obviously not going to share his name, he doesn't go to our church, um, but he, he uh, was looking at something that he shouldn't have on his, on his computer, but it was uh, the school's computer, and he didn't know that they had just installed this you know, software where they could see what he was looking at, right? You can't delete the history, and it gets sent. Uh, so anyway, the principal calls, teacher calls, counselor, have his parents come, he's called into the office, and they're going to look over his internet history, and you imagine just the terror on this kid the shame of they're going to look through all this stuff that I typed in, that I searched, that I watched. And, and, and I remember telling the guy, he had told us this, and I said, this is what the gospel's like. That moment, you're caught, dead in your tracks, can't delete the history. You know what they're going to read. You're just praying for like a Y2K to happen or something to shut the whole system down. You're done. This is what the gospel is. It's like they open the computer, open the history, and it's not just deleted. They say, all right, we're going to read so-and-so's history in front of his parents and everybody. And they read, okay, you looked at Gospel Coalition, Bible Gateway, RBC rerun sermons, <laughs> how to love and respect my parents and teachers. And the kid's like, what? Like, yeah, this, this is your history. Like, really? Like, yeah. How is that possible? I said, we don't know. You know, but, but, but this is what it is. That's how the gospel works. That if you're a child of God, the slate is erased because of Christ. He took it upon Himself on the cross. All the history. There's no incognito mode with God. He knows and sees it all. He takes it all upon Himself. And the wrath of God looked down and He experienced that shame and punishment. And in the transfer, what He did is He took His perfect righteousness where He never gave into temptation. He never failed. He never looked the wrong. He never did the wrong thing. And that righteousness has been given to you and that is your permanent record declared legally before God and all creation. That's the gospel we believe in. And if you're here this morning and you have failed in some way, I don't care how many divorces, how many affairs, how much pornography use, how much lust, how much coveting, or whatever it is, is covered by the blood of Christ if you're a child of God. It's a beautiful thing. And out of that statement, where here he says, you're in the light. Out of that, then he says, this is the key to your victory, Christian. It's when you understand that I'm saved and I'm washed and I'm sanctified that he says that's where the battle actually starts and that's where you can actually have victory. Look at, look at what he says in these next verses. He says, walk then as children of light. You're a child of light already. The slate's been clean. So now don't go back. He says, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that it becomes visible is light. He's saying, hey, your failures are not your identity. You don't have to live like that anymore because you're a child of God. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. 
Even if you're here and you're like, I, I don't know how I'm going to change. It's been years. It's been years. How am I supposed to, how am I supposed to make progress? I've heard some sermon. Like, how am I God's saying, hey, I can do it. By the power of me inside of you, I can do this. I can forgive and let's start walking in the light. You see, in Christianity, identity is received, not achieved. That's what you have to live in. Why are we talking about all this today? Society is really struggling in this area, right? We're going downhill, and I think we're going downhill fast. We don't know how to handle it. We don't know what to tell people. Like I said, we can't tell men that aren't attracted to their wives or women that aren't attracted to their husbands. You, have, you should hold to commitment, hold to integrity and honesty because it's like, no, whatever your sexual craving you desire. We, can't, we tell kids that maybe you're born the wrong gender and you can just change that. These are children, right? I used to work at a school, had an 11-year-old girl that didn't have parents, and she was starting hormone therapy at 11 years old to change her gender. And this is what she was counseled by teachers in the school. It's tragic. And I'm not hating on the LGBT community, right? They need hope just like all of us. But the problem is our culture doesn't know what to tell people. We've gone down this rule of there's a God who, who has made everything for his glory. We've abandoned that. Now there is no truth. you just got to find it. We're telling people in all the wrong places. But I think God cares about this so much for the church because we're the moral standard, aren't we? And I think as a church, what's happened to us is we've compromised so much that we're no longer sensitive to evil and sin. And, and, and the boundary's been pushed so far of, oh, well, you know, this movie, it, it's not total, total nudity or whatever. It's just a little bit, and so therefore it's okay. Yeah, every joke is basically mocking Christianity, and it's okay to live however you want in a cesspool of sin, but it's okay. It's funny, right? And we've just moved that line so far to where we accept so much where God says, no, I'm calling you to holiness, calling you to righteousness because you need to be the light. And if you're not going to be the light, no one is. That's our calling this morning. Look at who says Ephesians 5. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, verse 14, and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. He's calling us to wake up. Saying let's take sin seriously. Let's take imitating God seriously. Let's be a light. And if you're here and you're like, I can't do it. Can't do it. I'm going to go back to that story. Remember the, the pool a few, few weeks ago? There was that crippled man by the pool in the water. Jesus comes and the man's like, hey, it's been 38 years. I can't get up. I'm done. It's over. No one's going to heal me. I've tried over. I'm never going to be healed from being crippled. And Jesus looks at him. What does he say? Rise. Take your bread and walk. And you'd think that that guy could have looked at Jesus and be like, uh, no thanks. There's no way. I mean, I'm just going to try to stand up. Everyone's going to laugh at me. There's no way I can do this. I can't do it. It's been 38 years. You think you're just going to tell me? But what does the guy do? He rises, takes up his bed, and walks because he had faith in who Jesus was. That's the call for all of us. Do you have faith and believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, that, he can, that you can do all things through Him who strengthens you? A few applications. Are you actively and intentionally choosing to imitate God and not the world? Are you praying and saying, God, I'm going to choose today, Colossians 3, to set my mind on things above, or Philippians 4, whatever's true, just, noble, and right. I'm going to meditate on these things. Are you choosing to imitate God? Are you taking steps to fight evil and not imitate the world? For those of you in this room that struggle with any sexual sin, we're called to come forward and confess. You don't have to confess the whole church or to bear each other's burdens as believers, and so there are one or two people in your life that you can go to and say, hey, I'm struggling in this area, and I want to walk in the light, and will you hold me accountable? Maybe there's some things you need to get rid of in your home that are tempting you or places you're going, people you're talking to at work, old accounts on Instagram that you shouldn't be following anymore, areas that lead you to this temptation where Jesus said, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, take steps to fight this. If you're a parent or grandparent in this room that have young people, are you protecting those young people? The average age to start viewing pornography in America is 10 years old. And I don't blame the children, I blame the parents. We give them the devices, we have open access to everything. We cannot, if you love them, they're a child, they don't know. We need to protect them, take steps. We can talk about what those are, uh, apps and things you can get to protect your home. Let's take it seriously because sin leads to destruction and God calls us to walk in the light and victory. I want to close with this. Maybe you're still here and you're like, 
yeah, but I don't want to give up. I don't want to give something up. I don't want to, I don't want to fully surrender to that. Can I just plead with you, whatever the sin is, whatever, it's not worth it next to the preciousness and beauty of Christ. He is more beautiful, more magnificent than anything you will ever experience in your life. And you have to daily fight, daily fight, take up your cross daily and say, Jesus, you are more valuable, you are more, and you are pleasures forevermore. And I want to fight this and seek you. You're not going to be perfect. That's why it's a daily battle. Repentance is a daily thing. But will you ta- start taking steps to say, Christ, I want you to reign supreme in my life over my desires. Let's close. Father, what a, what a tough topic. And I, I'm so thankful, Jesus, that every time we see You encounter someone that was failing in sin, You didn't laugh at them. You didn't walk away and say, burn in hell. But You offered them hope. You offered the woman at the well living water. The woman caught in adultery. You forgave her. You told her to go sin no more. God, I pray that if there's anyone in the room right now that maybe the, the conviction of sin is heavy, that Lord, if they don't know You, would they come to You for the first time to experience that grace, that washing away of their sin, that, that, that image that's so clear of taking away all the internet history and replacing it with righteousness. That's what Your Gospel does for us. And I pray that that person would run into Your arms right now with grace and mercy and put their faith and trust in You and experience You say, I love You. And experience You clothing them in Your white robes saying, You are Mine. Your divorces don't define You. Your infidelity doesn't define You. I define You. I pray that they'd experience that. And I pray that any Christian in this room already would experience that grace that's so abundantly magnificent in You. God, I pray that we take our sins seriously, that the areas that we need to repent of, that we would do that. Even if we don't want to, even if it's like, I don't want to give it up, God, would this be the day where we say, Jesus, uh, to You I surrender all. I surrender all to You, Jesus. Not just part, but all. Be Lord over my life. God, I thank You for the forgiveness of sins. I thank You for Your truth that tells us how we should walk. Pray that it would be a light to our paths. In Your name we pray, Jesus, and everyone said, Amen.